So I was just reading it, it was just uh, for a second. It said, you're Jody Samuels, author, connector, speaker, nonprofit leader, world traveler that I watch all the time. Um, community <laughs> activist, special needs advocate, wife and mom. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, but today we're here really to, to discuss your, your uh, decision to make Aliyah uh, when you and your family came here. If you want to tell us a little bit about that. Um, when you guys came, why you decided to come. Um, go ahead. So thank you guys for including me in this conversation. It's an important one. Yeah. Um, my husband and I met when we were very young. I was 18 and I was here on my gap year after high school and we met on a street corner. He asked me if I speak English and I say, I said, yeah, so he, we realized we were both South African and we started talking. Um, on our second date, I told him that I wanted two things. One, that I wanted to have an open home. And the second was that I wanted to live in Israel. Mm -hmm. And he agreed with both those things. At the time when he finished, when he had just finished medical school and we had student loans, and we had a two-year plan because we needed to pay off these student loans. So we mm -hmm. thought we'd go work in these outback places, earn money, pay off the loans because you can make earn dollars and pay it off in rands. It's like a form of arbitrage. And all our friends knew we were coming to Israel, not this summer, but the next. Well, that plan took a bit longer <laughs> to implement because we took <laughs> all these places. We landed up living in New Zealand, Australia, we won green cards. We thought we'd go to New York just for a year or two. We were there for 15. And in 2014, we came to Israel in the summer, and that was Tsuketan. And I joked that Hamas was our Aliyah Shaliyah. <laughs> and <laughs> nice we, Shaliyah. <laughs> you, when you hear under stress, you see the best of Israeli society. Yeah. And at this Come moment, on. when, you know, firstly, there was missiles and people like carry on going out, you know, you listen to a, yeah. you, you hear a missile and then you carry on going out for your coffee and whatever. <laughs> there was soccer, it was the Israeli, um, it was sorry, World Cup soccer and Israelis are crazy as you know about soccer. <laughs> and I can't remember if it was quarterfinals or semifinals, but every street bar in all of um, Jerusalem we had screens and thousands of people on the streets and the atmosphere was selected he was there and there was something so special because you saw Haredi and Arabs and Jews all crowded around screens wow. and it was really amazing and some suddenly on the screen came a message in Hebrew and in those days I couldn't even read what the message said and I said to my son what does it say and like everything had gone quiet and it said they had found the body of those three boys when the three oh. boys had been kidnapped Oh. And it was so incredible to see the entire country go from celebration, that was the end of the soccer, to an entire country going to mourning. Mm -hmm. And I had like a moment then that I just realized I wanted to live in a more meaningful society. I wanted my kids to grow up in a place where life had more meaning. And after, you know, in the 23 years we'd been away, I'd become a princess and I had to be comfortable in my life overseas. And then I came home and I said to my husband, who was completely shocked, actually, maybe we should try Israel. Um, we came back, we were in Israel the whole summer. We came back and we got back to America and we did what all people do. We went on our nice uh, um, Costco shop, filled an apartment <laughs> with kids in school and when to speak to an Aliyah Shaliyah. They told us it would take six months. I had a contact at the Jewish agency. She said, send me your passports and everything. We were approved the next day for Aliyah. I had our visas the same week. Wow. So, and we wow. had a decision and people said to us, it's better for a child with a disability that she comes when she's in kindergarten. The earlier she learns Hebrew, the easier it will be for her. And they told us, don't worry, nothing happens to Achrei Chagim, which means nothing in Israel happens to after all the high holidays. And boy, were they right. <laughs> now that <laughs> nothing happens in this country <laughs> until then. And we decided Arab Rosh Hashanah and we left the day after Yom Kippur. And so 23 years of talking about it and 10 days of planning. 
Wow. Wow. Um, Jody, I didn't realize that. Wait, so you were here in 2014. It wasn't Aliyah. You were just here. And then, and then uh, it was a whole operation with Shloshta Nearim. And that's when you decided to actually come back. Is that what you, that's what happened? That was, yeah, that was the moment when I realized maybe we should do this. Because up until then, I'd been protesting. I'd gone from the idealist to the princess. And I was happy with my, and then I suddenly thought, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should do it. I, I'd also had another conversation with my son, which impacted me. He was all of 12 and we were talking and he said, Ima, sometimes I tell my friends 25% chance we'll stay living in Manhattan, 25% chance we'll move to the suburbs, 25% chance we'll move to Israel and 25% chance my Ima will come up with another idea. <laughs> so I no, Kayla has to finish school. It's too complicated with her. It will be at least another 13 years. And he looked at me and he said, Ima, but then I'll be married with children living in Israel. Maybe you want to come earlier. <laughs> now, I hadn't really thought about being a grandmother then, but he did put in perspective for me. You know, my kids were very focused on coming to Israel, my older children. And I realized that there was going to be a certain direction my family was going to go in. So I think the combination of things, and I decided, well, to give it a try. Wow. Wow. So you, are, are your son and daughter in the army now? Your son must be in the army or must finish? Yeah. He's in a Yeshiva Hester program. Um, and my daughter's in Yod Bet, so she's going to do a Mechina and then she'll go to the army after. Oh, wonderful. Like like my son and like my daughter. <laughs> Same <laughs> thing. Um so you were kind of preparing for it for many years, but then you had these like 10 days. Like, how, how do you think, I know you've had hardships here. I know things have not been easy for you, um, um, for you yourself, you know, the fact of the language and, and just so many different things. You were so used to being um, so independent and doing everything yourself. And so you come to a different country, uh, different culture. H how do you think people could prepare um, prepare for Aliyah better, maybe something that you, you, you know, you thought after the fact, maybe you could have done, made it easier for you. What would you say to people if they're thinking about Aliyah that, that could make it, um, and say it as it is, Jody. I love that about you. Say it as it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say that ultimately the difference between living here and visiting is like marriage and dating. <laughs> it's just a whole different world. And I think that one of the mistakes people make we is they come to Israel a lot and they feel they know Israel. But you know what? We came to Israel for eight years in the summer for two months. And my, my husband worked for Teva, an Israeli company. So on paper, we thought we knew what we were coming to. But the reality is when you come on these supposed look-see trips and things, it's not reality. Right. You're not opening mail. You're not trying to interpret like some document that comes from Batuach Lumi. You're not trying to figure out whether parking you can park there or not and then figure out how to argue the parking fine right. you're not going to the hairdresser you're not going to the dentist appointment right. you're not dealing with the school system so you can't say because you went somewhere and you had a really great Shabbat in a warm community that that's like Israel or when you went to the restaurants and Emek Raphaim in Jerusalem and all the white staff spoke English that that is representative of your life in Israel Right. Um, you know, you haven't dealt with the area, the municipal services and the school, the two places where English is very, very limited. Unless you have Russian, you really, really are, right. you need Hebrew or Russian to be able to solve some of those quandaries. So I just say to people, that coming on a look-see does not mean, and spending two months in Israel in the summer on vacation does not equal Israel. Right. And I also don't think with all due respect to Nefesh for Nefesh, when you look at these posts and they show these families with like the biggest smiles and happiest families, well, that's like picture perfect moments, but that doesn't mean what life in Israel is. So you have to be able to come to Israel sort of knowing that there's a lot of reasons to live here. There's a lot of idealistic reasons to live here. There's a lot of benefits for your children in terms of independence. Right. There's a lot of um, cost savings in terms of Jewish education, but you are coming to an extremely expensive country. You are coming to an extremely different cultural reality. And 
you are going to come to a country that unless your language is really, really, really at a fluent first person level, you're going to feel behind all the time. Does it mean you can make it? Yes. Does it mean you can be successful? Yes. Mm. Does it mean a lot of people work in overseas jobs? Yes. Is it very, very hard? Yes. And I feel that part of the problem is that a lot of the marketing makes Aliyah look like the perfect dream come true. And when we're preparing our kids for school or for life or for university, we don't tell our kids, you know, everybody's going to get married to someone rich, live in a fancy, beautiful palace, get into the best university and marry someone rich, beautiful and famous. So why do we pretend that Aliyah is perfect? Right. And then people need to know that whatever challenges you have, may you may, like if your relationships have challenges, you'll have challenges. If you have difficult kids, you'll have difficult kids. Right. And you will just add pressures to that because Israel is difficult. And my last point I will say on that, I lived in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, England, and America. And people <laughs> say to me, so many places is Israel really that different and the answer is yes it's different it's not a judgment is it good or bad maybe Israel's a hundred times better the question is is it that different yes there are so yes. many things subtly and culturally that are different whether it's how people RSVP to a party how you handle customer service situations um, to driving conditions on a road so yes, there's just the reality that there's like certain line in the ground, how other cultures act and Israel's different. It's not good or bad, but you right. have to come in that you're not going, it's not like moving from Johannesburg to Sydney and it's not like moving from Toronto to New York. This is a very different move. Right. No, I think, you know, my husband is Israeli and he always says to me, he says, being a tourist in Israel is the best thing ever. The best thing to be a tourist in this country is fabulous, but you're right. It's not the reality of living here. And I think what you're saying, and I totally agree with you is to, is to have a true picture of what the life is going to be here. Life is not going to be two months at the beach and two months of eating, you know, the best tasting food and going to the shook and, and having all, life is like you're saying, dealing with the realities of, of the everyday, the, the real life, not the, you know, I'm on vacation. And I think that that's a very important point. Um, just for a moment, I'll just explain for a minute about Olim Advisors, and then um, I want to ask you a couple more questions already, but Olim Advisors, really what we do is we, we, um, we handhold our clients with their Aliyah process from way before they make Aliyah until way after they get here. And, and the reason is that we really feel like there are so many challenges. There's a cultural challenge, a language challenge. And so we help with going to the different appointments and we help with trying to figure out the communities and with the schools. Like Jody, years ago, we were trying to help you with Kaylee and figuring out the different schools. And, it's, and it was different for me as an Israeli, it was difficult, you know, to, to figure out who to speak to and what makes the most sense for our kids. And, and then the basic things here that, that for me as an Israeli are a challenge, uh, setting up the utilities in my name and speaking to the banker and, and healthcare issues that are so important, which is why really we came up with all these packages. Today we have packages that help with real estate and help with, with your aliyah and help with families with children with special needs and people that have special healthcare issues. Um, because we understand that, you know, we're a country that wants aliyah, but we need to, I think, facilitate that much more and make sure that people really, when they get here, they are handheld, at least for the first few months, to be able to go through this process, to be able to um, not say this is too difficult, I'm going back to Sydney, to the UK, to South Africa, to wherever it is, because of the language, because the culture here is different, because in the beginning, sometimes the Israelis seem a little bit prickly, but really when you get to meet a lot of them, they really are very very warm, very good. The good ones are, are, I think, are wonderful. I see it all the time, helpful. Um, so I just want to comment on yeah. can I just comment on the need for services. You know, one of the things I tell people is they make the mistake of thinking they can figure it out. Right. And I think one of the biggest problems that people and part of what disillusions people is you can get taken advantage of really easily here, yeah. or you can make little mistakes that cost big. Right. And that is why you need someone to guide you through the process, whether it's like we used a contractor and 
you know, after the fact, you realize how this guy just took us for a ride. And we didn't know because we were just these gullible people. Right. Or you get a quote from someone and they see you speak English and they tell you 5,000 shekels. And then you get a quote from an Israeli and it's 500 shekels. Right. And so many times that people just take advantage of you. In the world in general, people are always looking to take advantage. It's not a new phenomenon. It right. just happens to be that you're the underdog in this situation. So when I knocked the mirror off my car and I went to ask the, the they told me, well, it's like 1,500 shekels and this and this and this. I call my friend who's Israeli. I say, well, how much do you think this should be? He says, let me call. He calls, he speaks to the guy in Hebrew, everything. He, he calls me back. He said, I told them that you're driving back in right now. Told them your car, the color of your car. And I said, that woman sitting outside is driving right back in right now. And you're going to charge her 350 shekels. Mm. And I'm saying that's where like an Olim advisors or someone who can help you. Because there are so many times that you're just that person that will take advantage. Not everybody takes advantage. But there's always like an element in society to take advantage of weaker people. And in this instance, when you don't have the language, you're the weaker person. Right. Or you don't know the you know, if you don't know the rules of getting a kid into school, right. one little mishap for me that I didn't know there was a certain rule lost me a whole opportunity to get my other daughter included in a school that I wanted. One person advising me could have changed the whole trajectory of my daughter's schooling that I couldn't reverse. Just right. didn't know the rule. And I think Jody, that's you're saying you guys so many smart things. I, 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 I think you have such a, an insight into things. You know, the fact that you're so realistic, the fact that you want to give a true picture, it's not that everyone's happy, smiley. No, you know, things are, are there are challenges. And, and the fact of, um, I agree with you. I also, um, you know, get help from many people for many things. And, and I think that it does save me um, a lot of hassles and many times a lot of money. Uh, and it is upsetting. And you're right, it is around the world. It's not necessarily just for here, but there is always this feeling of someone's going to uh, take advantage. And we do, we do try very much to protect our clients and to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, but there are a lot of moments, uh, beautiful, beautiful moments where I take people to different offices and people are like, Mazalto, you just made Aliyah and Kola Kavod. You know, there are those beautiful, you know, again and again. Um, tell me, uh, and, uh, yeah. Separate between you know when you pay for something just like someone would pay for financial planning services or most people don't file their own taxes so you have to put this in the same category i cannot figure out a foreign country with a foreign language with a foreign school system with a foreign medical system with a foreign everything without support and buying a house so just like you would outsource those things because you have to outsource doesn't mean the place is bad it just right. means it's complicated. So you have to separate bad and complicated. A hundred percent. No, a hundred percent. Tell me uh, something that stands in your mind and only in Israel's story, you know, something that you were like, wow. Um, I mean, there are so many only in Israel's <laughs> story. I know. Um, what of your favorites? I just remember that that summer that same summer when we were thinking of coming, I had taken my kids on a hike. It was a boiling hot summer day and we struggled to get a taxi back from where we were. And by the time we got in the taxi, we only had like a little bit of juice um, in the bottle and my kids were arguing over who was gonna drink it. And I was like, guys, don't worry, we're gonna be like, they were really thirsty and agitated. And the next thing the taxi driver turned around and he gave us a bottle of water. And I was like, you know, germophobic, you know, chutznikim, someone from overseas, like, oh, we don't share bottles. And he's like, just drink. I'm like, no, no, it's okay. And he was like, Gavert, when your children are in my taxi, they're my responsibility. <laughs> and I think that's part of Israel. You know, other people, that's why the bigger gives you advice that your child's too warm and too, too much in the sun and right. everyone feels they can get involved. But I think that story defines Israel and it's a very like Israeli is that people take responsibility. You know, you hear stories in like New York, a person gives birth on the backseat of a taxi and the taxi driver didn't even notice. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's just like a different culture. And I think that is, all those stories are so only in Israel. 
My daughter came home last night. She went to the mall. They went to buy her sister a, a present. She was so upset. She said, Ima, I went in the escalator, but she was going backwards. Like you're supposed to go down. She went up. I don't know, whatever she did. And she said, this woman was screaming at her, Matosa and Zikazema Sukran. And I said to her, she, she wasn't being mean because she kept saying, Ima, she was being so mean. She was being so mean. I said, no, she just cares about you. She didn't want you to get hurt. That's what it's all about. You know, I, and I think when you came here in 2014, that was, um, wow, that whole, those 18 days of looking for the boys and the whole country coming together, that was in my mind, um, um, so difficult, but so amazing. And it did, it showed the beauty of, of Am Yisrael. Um, I see, um, yeah, I see some of the moms here around actually in the neighborhood. And um, one of them is a, a mom of a, a daughter in one of my daughter's schools. So I would see her, Frankel, and amazing, amazing, just absolutely amazing. And the way the whole country came together. And I think those are the things that bring us here. And I think, at least for me, you know, they help me with, um, so you say it's challenges here, but you say the good overrides the bad, but it is important. I think it's so important, everything you said, to really know what you're going into, to prepare yourselves, to prepare your kids, to understand. And um, um, listen, two of your kids are going into the army. One's in the army, one's going in. It's, it's amazing. I mean, or I don't know if your daughter's going to go in, but Marina, they're here. They're, it's amazing to me also that your kids were older and that they wanted to be here. That's incredible. A lot of times kids kind of, you know, we have so many families that are coming and the, the teens are, are, you know, don't move us, don't, uh, you know, so I think that was a gift that you had also. The fact that maybe your son and your older daughter were, were, um, were pushing towards it. And uh, I don't know, I wish you guys only the best. And I hope uh, for all of your kids, they have success for all three of them. And for you guys, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. Anything else you want to add? Anything, Shira, Jody? I mean, I think I would also just tell parents that coming with a child with special needs, and I think this is an important conversation that should be part of it, is there is this perception in Chutzla Aretz that arriving with a child with special needs, that Israel has amazing special needs services. And I actually think that Israel has decent services. The challenge is they don't have decent services for inclusion. And people need to be able to understand there's a big difference because I've spoken to so many families who have children with challenges and there's a big misconception, including us who had this misconception. So if you are coming from an environment where your child was in a special ed environment and you didn't have the option of a Jewish special ed environment, it is amazing to come to Israel and have the option in whatever framework you want, a Haredi one, a modern Orthodox one, the secular one, Arab one, it doesn't matter, there's those frameworks right. with special ed. What they don't have is a proper framework for inclusion. So by law, you can include your child. They just didn't pass a budget that gives um, inclusion. You don't get the budget. <laughs> They passed the law that a parent can parentally place their child in any academic environment. They didn't pass a budget to go with that law. So by definition, there's no basket of services that follows your kid to right. an inclusion environment. So you get very limited therapy from your kupach from your health insurance, right. Right. and then limited hours in the school system. And I think this is where a lot of people are very surprised but if you are looking to do inclusion, you have to go with your eyes wide open and understand that inclusion requires a huge amount of time on behalf of the parents, a huge amount of investment because you have to supplement. There's no way you can do inclusion just with the limited one occupational therapy and one speech therapy a week you get from your Kabbalah for limb for 45 right. minutes. That is right. And that needs to be built into the financial equation. And I'm happy to speak to parents who have children with disabilities, should you choose a special needs environment? I can't really answer that. I just know there are a lot and there are a lot of very good ones and catering for people with language, for autism issues, for cognitive issues, learning disability. But if you should be like me, an advocate for inclusion, and I'm not talking about like that fake inclusion or half inclusion where your kid goes to the gym and, you know, I'm lunchtime with regular kids kind of thing. I'm talking about, where your kid is properly included in a classroom with support to achieve a subset of education of that class 
That kind of program does not exist here and costs a lot of money to create, to make, and a lot of time and investment. And a lot of families that I've spoken to with children with disabilities confuse good special needs services and inclusion education are very different right. programs. Wow. Well, we have to talk, Jody. We'll talk separately. Maybe we can figure out how to advocate for this. I wonder if we can, uh, I, I hear what you're saying. It says Shilov instead of Shilov immersion rather than Chinuch uh, Meyuchad, the special needs. Okay, that's very important for people to know. And definitely if we have uh, families that are thinking about it, we'll send them your way so they could speak to you. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. I know you're super, super busy, but you really gave us a lot to think about and so many good points. And again, thank you for your honesty. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> have a Yom Tov. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.